Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining me today. Really excited about today's episode. But before we get to today's episode, I just want to send this little message out to you. Happy Thanksgiving. Now, listen, I'm probably not going to talk to you until after Thanksgiving. So I just want to ask you this question before we get into today's episode. What is your favorite dish to eat at Thanksgiving dinner? Now, for those of you outside of the United States, you might be thinking, How does that apply to me? I don't know. Hopefully you have Thanksgiving in your country. But on behalf of everyone here at Other People's Shoes, I just want to say thank you. This Thanksgiving, I am thankful and grateful for you, for you hitting play each and every week. I'm really excited about that. I'm also excited to announce to you, we have 2024 already planned out. That's right. I'm telling you in advance so you can stick around for 2024. Every single season is planned. The three seasons that we do a year is planned out. And I'm excited about January. I'm excited about what's going to happen in May. And oh, by the way, I'm also excited about what's going to happen next September as well. So all three seasons are planned. Before we get to that, we have to finish out this current season. You're only. So won't you join me right now as it takes us into this Thanksgiving episode. Happy Thanksgiving. Welcome into Other People's Shoes, the podcast where listeners get to step into the lives of others and see the world through their shoes. Your host, Neil Matthews, is a seasoned interviewer who has a natural talent for empathizing with his guests and drawing out their unique perspectives. Through a combination of storytelling and insightful questioning, Other People's Shoes explores the lives of a diverse range of guests, from everyday people to celebrities and thought leaders. With a warm and welcoming style, Neil creates a safe and supportive space where guests to share their stories while also challenging listeners to broaden their perspective and think more deeply about the world around them. So tune in to Other People's Shoes with Neil Matthews and get ready to step into other people's shoes. Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for hitting play today. I never, ever, ever, ever want to take that for granted. Now, listen, I, I know we all could be playing all kinds of things today. I'm trying to think of the latest thing I've been playing. So on the way from Amazon has not really fully arrived yet. I have a new set of golf clubs. See, recently, and when I say recently, like within the last year or so, a friend of mine actually said to me, he said, you know, Neil, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but you're clubs are too small. And I was like, what? What do you mean? I've been playing with these for years. And he goes, yeah, I think I know your problem. You're playing with too small of clubs. He said, you're tall and you need taller clubs. His name's Guy. And I said, Guy, listen, I don't know what to tell you. I'm just going to keep playing with these. He goes, that's fine. You're not going to play very well. And so that got me thinking, who are we playing well with in our lives today? So all that to say, welcome in my new friend, Jody. Jody, how are you today? I'm great. Oh my gosh. I'm over here cracking up with your story, Neil. That's the greatest. (laughs) Well, it is a true story. And I guess that's the problem that I run into sometimes is I think in life, we don't play well with others. As much as we want to, as much as we we strive to, I find myself more and more scratching my head going, why was I like that? Why was I like this? It is a struggle I still run into. Why do I have to show empathy to that person? Mm, So good. Yeah. And I love the honesty of your friend. One could have said anything and you could just been playing with the wrong size clubs for a long time. Well, and maybe that fits into us and you and I today is is like, how many times have you heard bad advice from somebody or good advice and you never took it? Well, Jody, how are you? You know what? I'm doing well. I'm not going to lie. I'm tired. You know what? I'm doing great. I love God puts an interview on a day where I've had a lot going on because I know he's going to help me get through it and it's not going to be my own strength. But yeah. (laughs) I was at the hospital late last night. I'm good. Well, so Jody, help us with this because I love to lead off every show with this question. That's this. What style of shoe do you love to wear? Okay, so it's so funny because I've been listening to some of your other episodes. And Neil, I just wear flip-flops. I'm a California girl. I know it's not very exciting. I know it's not like a fancy shoe. My favorite place to be is the beach. I love to take my book down there and read. You will find me in flip-flops most likely every time I can wear them. So I guess that's my shoe of choice. (laughs) Well, my cousin spent most of her adult life, I think, in Mission Viejo. California. So I don't know how far that is from you. That city neighbors my city. That's crazy. She's just so close. She just relocated actually to Tennessee. She would tell me because she was in this marketing type thing. I never understood her job. If I don't understand a job, I assume that somebody works for the government. That's just kind of how my mind goes. (laughs) 
in her job, she would tell me she would wear stilettos because she's not very tall. She would wear stiletto heels. And then when she'd get in the car, she'd switch back to flip flops. It's great. They're my favorite. So I've been wearing them nonstop. I can wear them every day here for almost obviously the winter not. But the beach is my happy place. That's all I can say. I miss the California beach. The Oregon beach is here. Not as exciting as they are in Southern California or even. So on to this. We're in this season in this series called You're Only. And when you heard that, what kind of resonated, what percolated in your mind, in your spaces? I love that. Pointed that out to me because I never had seen that verse and I never had seen that line where it says you're only. I think we were on the phone talking about it. And for me, it made me think Saul did not think that David was strong enough or big enough to fight Goliath. And I just start started thinking, what are my not enoughs? And I know it's different. You're only different than not enough. But to me, I jump into the you're not enough. For me, I walked through a divorce. That's part of my storyline. As a Christian, something I'm not happy about and wasn't what I wanted for my family. At the same time, I feel like God used that as ways to catapult my growth in a way I've never known possible. For a long time, I felt not enough. As a Christian, like I was a failure. Remember saying to God, I don't know how you can use me anymore. I'm a divorced woman. I just had put this level of shame on myself that I thought, okay, I'm not able to be used by God anymore. So that was my not enough. Someone else is hearing you're only single or you're only. So that's what I had walked through. Then I had this really special divine appointment. I love when God takes something that we're struggling with and he brings someone else into our lives to like share truth to us. And I was at this women of faith retreat. It was this conference and I had gone there to hear my favorite speaker and another lady had gone on the stage. I didn't know who she was at the time, but she was speaking about spiritual warfare. At the time she was saying, maybe what you're walking through has nothing to do with who you are now, but who you're going to be. And it was at this moment in time where I felt God saying to me, this is for you. The words that I heard in my heart, him say to me was, you're not a broken vessel. I can still use you. And you may have a broken heart. You have a broken story and you may have walked through brokenness and you feel broken. You feel shattered. You are not a broken vessel and I am still going to use you. That's right after that conference is when a lot of my ministry began. It's just wild. At one point in time, I didn't think I could be used anymore by him. Well, you bring up David, which is kind of our central figure. There hasn't been a soul in Jody's life that Mm. somewhere along the way said to Jody, listen, Jody, you're only going to be this. Again, you're only going to be a divorced woman, you're only going to be mom. Those aren't bad things or good things. Like we were just saying a moment ago, good advice versus bad advice. My thought process is somewhere along the way, even for David, a lot of people probably second guessed him. Didn't even make the lineup for the family. Samuel comes to anoint the king yeah, and he doesn't even make the lineup. He's out in the field. How does that relate to you? I would imagine just by what you're describing already, there's got to be some folks along the way, those naysayers, the noise, as some would call it. So how has Jody ignored the noise and continued to press forward? Well, I love that you brought up that story where Samuel anoints the future king and the dad doesn't even bring David in. I would just think as a child, you would be so upset if everyone was coming to the house and all your siblings were there and your dad doesn't even include you. And you have any more kids? Oh, yeah, I guess there's one more out in the field. How he must have just felt overlooked by his earthly father. His heavenly father had bigger plans for him. Ask me that question about Saul. There's not like one person that I would say would be my Saul, but on a whole, I think I felt judgment for what was going on with my life, even though maybe there wasn't one specific person. I do remember going to the church to get some counsel and this woman, I was a very strong believer. I had a bunch of people praying. This isn't something I wanted for my life. With a marriage, it takes two to fight for it. There I am in this situation. And she was almost saying Bible verses to me that, you know, this isn't what God wants for your life. And I'm just looking at her like, I didn't come here to get this from you. I came here to get some counsel on legal matters. It was like this legal thing they offered at the church. I finally, in the middle of it, said, I'm going to leave. This isn't helping me and putting more hurt and pain on me when I already have enough hurt and pain. Came home and I called this lady in the church and I said to her, I can't believe this woman. I understand all what she was saying because I know it all to be true. She doesn't understand my specific circumstances. It was so painful. And so maybe I guess she could be like that. You don't always know what's happening in someone else's shoes. You have to enter into it. You can't just start quoting. Yes, I believe God doesn't want people to get divorced. Like I know that to be true. That's not what I wanted for my life here I am in that situation. And it was, are you going to heap more shame on me? Or are you going to help me? I remember just getting to this place where I literally got up and left in the middle of the meeting. And I said to her, I hope this isn't what you say to everyone that walks in here. Cause I think many people will think the church is not a place to welcome us. They're going to think they're just like David felt overlooked. They're going to think they're overlooked as well. David felt to my dad, why didn't you include me in this meeting? I felt like this lady was kind of saying, you're not welcome here. Even though that's not what she said, it was a very painful meeting called some of the leaders in the church because I was involved in leadership at the time in a women's group and they just couldn't believe that's what was happening. She would be maybe kind of like my Saul, but just someone that added more hurt to the already hurt. There was already enough pain and hurt and shame I was feeling I didn't need someone else adding to it. That's the root of my question is somebody comes into the picture, whether they play a cameo role or 
maybe a supporting actress role. They come in and they do more damage than good. Mm -hmm. I think that's what a lot of this series has even spurred on for me is the idea of who have I allowed to speak into my world? Lately, I've been more selective than I have in the past. Past, I would do almost like a family feud mentality. I would go survey 70 people. Okay, 70 people think (laughs) you should go do this, Neil. I'm like, ah. And then 20% say you should do this. I'm like, oh, okay, 20, only 20 on that one. I'm wondering about that for you. There's so much power in getting advice, but there's also so much fear in it. If you take somebody's advice, whether it be good or bad, what's it going to do to you? How is it going to mess up you in the future? Or how is it going to maybe propel you forward? I think it can do both. What are your thoughts on that? Mm, I think that's great. Yeah, no, I actually have a mentor that's amazing that speaks a lot of truth into me. It's funny, I've been calling her a lot the last week. We've had a lot that I've been trying to process with her. I think it's important of who you let in. Consider the source. I remember someone saying that one time to me, and I think that's really good advice. Who is this person? Someone that knows you, knows what you're walking through? Is it someone that can speak truth to you? If not, then consider the source. Maybe that's not advice you take. Maybe that's not the wisdom you seek. She is a very strong believer. She knows me. She's walked through so much of my life. If I'm going through a hard thing, she's the one I call. She's the one I seek advice from. I have some other friends that have also walked through the same storyline. Sadly, they are divorced. They are someone I'll call a lot, especially when we're dealing with parenting, because single parenting is difficult. I'll reach out to them. This other friend of mine, too, she has spoken truth into me where sometimes I didn't want to hear what she had to say. I realized later, just like your friend told you about the golf clubs, they're too short. I realized I needed to hear what she had to say. And as much as it wasn't what I wanted, I knew she was a safe person that is telling me the truth that I knew I can rely on. God confirmed it later. So I think maybe after you hear from someone, you got to then go to God and say, hey, is this also you confirming this? Or is this the Holy Spirit? Is this true? Is this something I need to work on? Is this an area? For me, I had a lot of reactivity issues. I was very angry. It would explode. And in my book, I have a book called Depth, Growing Through Heartbreak to Strength, because I feel like my greatest heartbreak catapulted me to my greatest growth. I have a chapter called Embrace the Chisel. And I'm going to tell you right now, I get real vulnerable in it. My sisters are like, I can't believe everything you shared. I'm very open with sharing my part in the story. I talk about my anger and my reactivity that happened and how that did not help bring closeness into my marriage. I talk about some of my issues. The story starts out with that one friend telling me some truth at dinner that night. And I remember not wanting to hear what she had to say, but going home and God confirming what she had to say. And so I do think it's important who you allow into your life and who's speaking truth into you. You have to be wise because you could easily get bad advice from someone. Trees are my thing. I like to talk about trees with deep roots. On the cover of my book is this big tree with your deep roots because that's where I felt my faith grew the most. When I speak, I talk about the sequoia trees in California. And so these are the tallest trees in the world. When I got there, I can't wait to see how deep their roots went. The ranger was like, no, they don't have deep roots at all. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're like messing with my whole message that I speak on. And then he said, they don't go deep. They go wide and they interlock tree roots with the trees next to them. And that's the community part. And so when I speak, I say, who have you interlocked tree roots with? That is the person that's going to be speaking truth into you when you call on a bad day. That's the person that's going to give you that advice. Who have you interlocked tree roots with? Because if it's not someone of similar faith, and if it's not someone that has a similar season of you, they're not going to give you wise counsel. That's where I stop and think. My mentor is so wise. She's definitely similar faith. This friend, definitely it's important who you allow to speak truth to your life. Well, you think about it from this standpoint, and and this is a verse kind of sort of struggle with on some level. It also scares me on other levels. Heard people say, and even scripture says, Satan can mask himself as an angel of light. Mm. In other words, he can come and be a fraud. He can come and be a poser. Back in the day, that's what we would say. Those pretending to be somebody they're not. You know, nowadays we may say a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's what I'm wondering about for you. For ladies specifically, who should be speaking in your mind? If you were going to counsel ladies, if you were going to be on the biggest platform, being in California, you got Levi's Stadium just probably down the street from me in some respects in Santa Clara. It's a big stadium. A lot of folks can fit in there. We get you on that elevated platform. What would you say to those ladies in that moment who have maybe struggled with these inner voices that says, you're not good enough. You're not enough. This is all you're ever going to be. Again, putting these limited beliefs on them, what would be your counsel to them? Well, I would first of all validate them and say, I think we all have those thoughts. As a woman, I think it's really something we struggle with. We think we're not enough or that we think we don't have enough wisdom. I don't have enough power, strength. I'm tired. You know, especially those new moms. I speak a lot to mops groups. And so these young moms, I'm like, I get it. 
it. You're so tired. You're sleep deprived. You wake up, you feel like you've been hit by a truck and you're now supposed to parent a kid and you feel these not enoughs. It's interesting. I had a speaking engagement. I wrote 10 truths to combat you're not enoughs. I actually found a scripture verse to go with each one. So I first say, figure out which one is you're not enough. Where do you right now feel not enough? You're not good enough. There's something in your past and find a verse that's God's truth to you. Nothing you do in life, God can not use. I want to say to that woman that feels I can't be used by God because I've been through, you know what? None of that's true. That is Satan trying to keep you shackled in shame. God wants you to live free in grace. You can be used. And that's what I felt that day when I sat in that stadium and that woman spoke. God said, I can still use you. What you've been through, you are now going to enter into someone's life in that same pain point. And you're going to be able to reach women that you couldn't have reached if you hadn't walked through your divorce. Now, that doesn't mean that everything we walk through something good, but God can use it for good. I would say to that person that maybe had an addiction in her past who's just struggles with anxiety and worries. And, you know, that's such a big thing for moms. We worry. And what if God can give you some truth and then you can go along and help someone else? And it's never wasted. One of the things I say in my book is God never wastes our pain. I walked through three great heartbreaks in my life. And sadly, I'm walking through another one now with my mom. The reason why I'm so tired is she was in the hospital last night, but she's going through dementia right now. And she fell last night. My three heartbreaks are my divorce, but I went through a miscarriage and then I lost my good friend to cancer. I feel like God has taken those three things and said, okay, now you're going to be able to enter into people's lives in these same areas or even someone else that walked through something different because now you know what it feels like to have lost a friend or to have lost a loved one. And so he doesn't waste, even if it's just grief, it doesn't have to be a feeling that you're feeling not enough. Maybe you're walking through really hard circumstances right now and you just feel like I can barely get out of bed and do my job as a mom. I feel like I'm just struggling. I would say invite God into it. None of it's going to be wasted. He is going to use all of it in such a beautiful way. I just think back to that woman sitting in the stadium, me just feeling so unusable, walked through something that now I couldn't be used in ministry. And I remember clear as day, God was reminding me that is not true. So if someone else is, has their own thing, maybe the same as mine, I want to say to them, you may have a broken heart. You may have a broken story. God can still use you. And he wants to use you in that very place. Like who better to help someone that's walked through an addiction than someone that's walked through an addiction? That very place that you're struggling, that very place you feel not enough is where he's going to use you the most. So many times in life we think, well, I'm not being used the way I should be. Mm-hmm. The tree thing that you're into, the three trees. Have you heard this story? There are three trees on a hill, all three trees on the hill. One tree says one day to the other two, he says, listen, I dream of one day being an amazing treasure chest where jewels can be stored. And one day a, a logger comes and cuts down the first tree and he's put aside, put away for so long. And he ever thinks I'm, I'm never going to see the dream of being this amazing treasure chest to hold all these gems. And one day he's crafted into this box and he's not sure what's going on. He feels hay being shoved into him and he's like, man, this is not what I thought about my life being. And one night this lonely man comes with his wife to be and they put inside him this baby. And he's mm-hmm. like, this is not what I envisioned. I'm not a feeding trough. I'm not a I'm not a crib. I'm supposed to hold treasure. Little did he know he was holding the treasure of the world. Jesus. The second tree was just freaking out too. He's like, man, did you hear about what happened to our buddy? He's now holding the treasure of the world. Man, I dream of one day sailing the amazing ocean and having royalty upon me and going into war and being in battle. And, and then he was cut down too. And he was put in this lumber yard forever, it was crafted into a boat. And he goes, here I go. I'm going to, I'm going to get my dream. I'm going to have this great success. And this guy who looked like a homeless person one day, joined him on the shore, was out speaking in the water. And he's like, this is not what I envisioned. I envisioned all these battles and all these victories. Little did he know he was holding the king of the world on his bow. Wow. And the last tree is like, well, I want everyone to look at me. I want to be this tall, majestic tree where everyone one day will see me and look at me with respect because I just feel like I've just been left behind. All my friends are gone. Nobody's left but me. Again, the logger comes and constructs him into what he sees as the most hideous thing he could ever be made into. He was made into an item that would be used to hang criminals and kill them. And Mm. he's just not even being used the way he thought. And lo and behold, hanging from him one day is the savior of the world. Now, obviously, that's a fast version of that story and modified in some respects by myself. This idea that we're created and made and we think we should be doing this and we should be doing that and we we need to be doing this. And I meet people all the time on the show or who want to come on the show who tell me all the time, like, listen, Neil, I have this fire. I have this desire that burns in me that people need to know about and people need to experience. Tell me about it. And they struggle with that. And I'm not throwing rocks at those that struggle with that. I mean, some are articulate, some are not. Problem I run into sometimes. How did you really develop 
who you are and how did you really develop this message that you knew without a shadow of a doubt, this is what Jody was supposed to do? Well, first of all, I love that story with the trees. I've never heard it. And I think it's fascinating because each one of them desired something. God gave them what they desired, but just not how they thought it was going to look. That is where our expectations of what God's going to do and what God actually does can sometimes hinder us. I'm a teacher. I'm a science teacher. I teach science in a STEM lab. I do these fun hands-on activities for kids. They just love coming to my room. We do engineering. We do robotics. I I never set out to be an author, to be a podcaster, to be a writer, to be a blogger. None of that. None of that was on my radar. If you had asked me, it was not even a desire of my heart to write a book. I love how God takes sometimes the things that we never wanted to go through. And he says, I'm going to grow this in you. So go back to that stadium because this is such a pivotal moment in my life. That was in September. And when I came home, I was just so fired up from all that I had learned that I just sent out an email to people, family and friends with just some words in it. Truths I had taught. And a couple people wrote back, wow, you should start start a blog. No, no, no. This is not my skill set at all. I heard it from five different people. So, you know, when you kind of hear something over and over, you're like, okay. So about a month later, I started a blog and my very first post was all about being vulnerable. This moment at that conference where I felt, oh, God could still use me, but I hadn't really told the world that I was getting divorced. Like my close friends knew, family knew, my kids were young. And so I remember my very first blog post was me sharing and being vulnerable. And there was a quote that I'd heard on social media. Everyone shares their highlight reel. No one shares their behind the scenes. And so I called it vulnerability. And I said, here's my behind the scenes. And I didn't get into a lot of the details. I just said, our family's walking through this and God is faithful. And I pointed back to God and just said, he has been faithful through everything. Well, there began the beginning of this ministry that I had no idea what God was going to do. After that, I did blogging for many years. Book idea came to my mind. God dropped this idea for a book. And I was like, God, I don't know how to write a book. And so he just, you know, trusted me through this. And one thing after another. So I would say I didn't have any of these skill sets. God developed them in me, but it was through small acts of faithfulness. I did a blog post. It was 2014. And I didn't even write the book till 2018. The book didn't come out to 2022. So this has been a journey. Each year I felt like God was growing some of these skills in me. I joined groups to help me grow in my right. God's going to put something on your heart. He's going to equip you. He's not going to say, Hey, this is what I want you to do. And good luck. I hope you have the skill sets for it. So there's people that don't feel enough. Like I remember the podcast. This is clearly, I am not a techie person. You know, I look at your setup and you've got all these cool things and you seem very techie. Maybe that's something in your wheelhouse. That's not me. And so God said to me, clearest day in my heart, depths of podcast. And I was like, depths of podcast. I don't know how to do a podcast. Like I can barely do an Instagram post without asking my kids, hey, how do I do this? You know, I want to add this to it. And they would have to come help me when I first started out. And I just felt not techy enough. That was probably my not enough statement back in 2019 when he asked me to start a podcast. And I really struggled with it for like a month. I think you got the wrong girl. I don't think this is me. Guess what? I just realized he could equip me. There's so many tutorials on the internet. So I took this bold step, putting on this shirt that had a big tree with deep roots on it. I went outside, had my kids take a picture of me. I posted it all over my social media over Memorial Day and on my website, Depth Podcast coming this summer. Had no idea what I was doing, Neil. Had no microphone yet, nothing. I just announced it was like my leap of faith. Okay, God, you've asked me to do this. I'm going to do it. That summer, Googling, how do you start a podcast? And and guess what? My first episode rolled out the end of August. (laughs) I made it before the end of summer. I just, I think that sometimes we get ahead of ourselves, that God will give you the knowledge. God will give you the words. God will, the Holy Spirit will come over you and tell you what the next step is. Your job's just faithful. God's part is fruitful. We do not need to know all the things to move forward. We do not need to have all the answers to take the step he's asking us to take. Take, And maybe that's to start a Bible study. Maybe maybe that's to help in a ministry at the church that's already there and you know God's put on your heart a bunch of time. Maybe it's to give a gift financially to someone. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's to share the gospel with your neighbor. Start a podcast. I don't know what it is God's putting on your heart to do. You're not enough. You're only this. Don't let that feed into your brain. God's not saying that to you. God's saying, partner with me. We are going to be a powerful duo. And I don't think God told me everything that was going to be ahead because I don't think I would have done. I don't think I would have moved through that first step starting the blog if I knew what you're going to write a book. You know, I think he takes us slowly through things, guides us along the way and gives us the words, gives us skills, the wisdom, and then asks us to rely on him. Because really, if you have a God-sized dream and you think you can do it yourself, then <laughs> it's not a God-sized dream. You're doing it for your own glory, not for his. Thank you for that. The interwovenness of all of that. That's good stuff. The reason why I bring that about is I think back again to that scene with David as he's coming up on Goliath. The part that we haven't talked about yet is he is sent there by his dad to check on his brothers, bring him some supplies, check on his brothers, see what's going on, and then report back. I imagine as he's walking the ranks, wait, you're, hey, check it out, Joe, that guy's going to go find Goliath. Can you believe that? Like, feel like they're pointing and laughing. Mm. And you know, as a teacher, you know this probably better than most. The idea of kids pointing and laughing at another kid in a negative fashion, not a fan of. I would imagine you're not. No, I'm not. What goes to your mind when you hear about that happening to an individual where someone's looking at their life and laughing? 
laughing at them with disgust and disdain. Well, it's interesting because I think some of the people that were pointing and laughing were his actual siblings. Like, didn't his brother come up and talk? What are you doing? You get out of here. You're not supposed to be here. Really, if you think about it, it wasn't just random people. It was his relatives. One of my favorite Bible characters is Joseph. And I think about Joseph was also rejected and betrayed by his own family. I like to enter into the story of these people because I think we read the Bible and we think, oh, this is what happened. But really put yourself in that, the shoes. You're David, you're walking up and your brother or your sister, whatever you have is the one taunting or you're Joseph and you're the one looking up out of the pit and there's your brother's glare of hate and anger staring back at you. I like to do things called Bible shoes on my podcast where I put myself in the shoes of someone in the Bible and I try to understand. And it's kind of funny because your podcast with other people's shoes, it's like, are we really entering into it? What were they thinking? What were they feeling? It really makes the Bible come alive when you do this. We're walking up. I'm David. I'm in the shoes of David. I'm walking up and I'm just there to talk to my brothers and check in on them. I have no idea this God appointment that God has. I've just come from the fields where I've been watching the sheep. But what I love is that God had been preparing David for this for quite some time. And he didn't even know. He fought off lions and all sorts of things that were going to come attack the sheep, bears. And Goliath, I mean, it's obviously maybe a little bit more scary, but at the same time, it's still someone that's coming to attack big animals. I feel like God's preparing it, but he has no idea. So he shows up, he hears these, this giant taunting God. Where's your God? And all the other people in Israel are cowering in fear. And he's like, wait a minute, that's my God he's talking about. I'm going to step forward in faith. And so I love that he doesn't care what other people think. Goes to Saul and Saul says, put on this armor and he puts it on. He's like, no, 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 this is not how I'm doing this. I'm not going to do it in what you think I should do. I'm going to fall down trying to wear all this. He does it in what he knows God's given him the skill sets to do. I think it's good when we put ourselves in the shoes of that person. I love that he runs toward Goliath. I think that those people watching probably thought, man, that kid's scared. I don't think he was scared, Neil. I think he was, okay, God, this guy's messing with you and I'm going to take you down in your name. And he like runs towards him. I mean, if you're scared, you're kind of walk or wait for the guy to come near you. But no, he runs to him. I love that part in the Bible. These little details of would I be running towards that? I don't know. I probably wouldn't. Just some insight from that story that I love. I think it's important to put ourselves in the shoes and the people that were taunting him were his siblings. And I just can't even imagine the pain that must have caused him. He didn't let it derail him from the purpose God had for him. Talk about in this moment is the idea that there are people, even in your own family, when you feel you're led to do something, they're going to say, mm, are you sure? Mm, I don't think that's what you're supposed to be doing right now. Yeah. And then we stop or we freeze and we're like, you know what? You're probably right. I'm, I am I, I shouldn't be writing this book. I, I shouldn't be writing this blog. I, I shouldn't be producing this podcast. Nobody's going to listen anyway. You know what? You're, you're probably right. And then we stop and we don't do that thing, whatever it may be, that we're being called to do. Yeah. I think about the major people in our life, the Billy Grahams of the world, the Rick Warrens, the whoever you may want to put in that category of these elite people. Mine would be Michael Jordan. Jordan. Somewhere along the way, I'm sure told Michael Jordan, especially his his siblings, listen, Mike, not your forte. You're not good enough to play basketball, whatever it may be. I think we, we do such a travesty to somebody and an injustice to somebody when we put a limited belief on them. How does that play out in the school system for you that you see? You know what? I'm a science teacher. So the kids come to me kind of like a specialty lab. I'm not their regular classroom teacher. So I have the whole school sees me from kindergarten through sixth grade. So I have like a thousand kids coming through. So I don't maybe see all the little little injustices and things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis that you would see if you were the regular classroom teacher. So I'm going to go ahead and say, I probably can't speak into that as a school teacher. For some reason, want to shed their light onto someone else's situation when it's really none of their business or speak into you and the naysayers, like you called it at one point. And I think we have to ask ourselves, who are we allowing to speak truth to us? That same question you asked me before, who is the person in your life we're going to listen to? Maybe it's not even family. Maybe it's friends. I think friends can play just as much squinching your dream or helping you meet your dreams. Because if you have this idea that comes to your head that God gave you and you share it with a friend and they just kind of go, eh, that right there, that could be that pivotal moment where you don't take that next step. So I would say you got to really be careful who you're speaking truth into. And maybe you don't just listen to one person. Maybe that's multiple people. If you hear it from every single person telling you, eh, then maybe they're there's some truth into that you need to think about it. If it's just one person, I would say, do not let one person tell you and squench your dream if God's given you the dream. Like you said, Michael Jordan, someone said to him, or maybe he at one point even felt not good enough to play. I think sometimes we could be our naysayer. We could have doubts. We could have these things that we say, oh, oh, I couldn't do that. Like again, if I go back in time, I was like, God, I'm not techie enough for this calling you placed on me. But I could have 
walked away. And I think back and think, wow, what if I had, I just celebrated my four year birthday of the podcast. It is one of my favorite parts of my ministry, Neil. I think you can attest to it. You love getting to talk to other people. We've talked about this on the phone where these God stories and these stories of faithfulness of how God's meeting them or helping them and you know, all their struggles. And I just sit there and it just ignites in me just excitement for like, wow, I get to highlight this person's story or I get to hear this person's story or I get to be a part of their story as they share it to others. And I just think, well, I could have lost, I could have not had any of that if I had just said, you know what, I'm going to stay stuck in what I know. And I'm not good enough for this. I'm only a school teacher. How can I start a podcast? I'm only a mom. How can I start to realize, you know what? God's not wanting that. He's wanting us to step out in faith and say, hey, I called you this and you're going to quit me. And it's not easy. It's not fun. Sometimes it requires a little, I don't want to say tr- a trust is what it requires, but sometimes it requires faith, but sometimes it requires us taking a big step out of our comfort zone. And a lot of people don't always want to do that. But this safe place, if I had stayed safe and never started it, look at all I would have missed. Like I always think about that. So now it's like, God, if you put something in my heart, it's always going to be a yes because now I see what I would have missed if I had said no. There's power in the yes. One of my favorite movies, I know some people will maybe not love the actor himself, but I love Jim Carrey. I really do. I'm admitting that. He's funny. One of my favorite movies though that he ever did was Yes Man. The idea that you start saying yes to everything could be a good and there could be a bad with that. The idea to me, if if I'm saying yes to something, I'm definitely saying no to something else. And that's the mindset that I've always tried to say is, okay, if I'm saying yes to doing maybe more hours working with the show, then I'm saying no to something else. So I think there has to be that balance. So for you, how does Jody find the balance in that? It's funny that you say balance because I think this is something I struggle with. <laughs> you had asked one of the questions like, what's something you're struggling with? It's like balance, time management, because I do have many hats that I wear. Okay, I'm going to be a teacher. Okay, now I'm going to be the podcaster. Okay, now I'm going to go speak. Now I'm going to write. Balance is big. I would say I I don't say yes to everything. I have to really say, is this in my lane? One time a really great opportunity opened up, but it's not, it's not what I'm doing. I would love to help people walk through grief because I've walked through so many heartbreaks. That's one of the, my areas I like to. I like to help people grow deeper in their faith because that's something that I feel like that heartbreak catapulted me to this depth in my faith. It still is something that's ongoing. You never arrive, but it's something. So I like to help people. I like to help people get stronger in their relationships because so much of what I learned after my divorce was emotional literacy and how to name my feelings and know what I'm feeling so I can help my kids walk through their grief. So these are my lanes, Neil. So if someone comes up with me and they say, hey, I have this project. Does that fit into what I feel God's called me to do? And even if it's the coolest idea. If it's not, then I have to really pray about it because maybe it's something he wants me to step out and try something new or it's, hey, that's going to derail me and just distract me and I need to stay in my lane. Balance, I think, is knowing what God wants you to be doing. So they got to be in the word. You got to be praying. You got to be inviting the Holy Spirit into your life. Many times in my journal, I use the words, guide me today. What do you want me to accomplish today? Because sometimes I wake up and there's so much to get done. Where do I start? Just say, I struggle with balance. It's probably my ongoing thing where daily I'm like, oh, I said too many yeses this week. I'm feeling frazzled or, oh, maybe I could have handled that. Margin your life's important. One of the things I realized with my divorce is time is precious. Time is a gift. I had always thought time was great, but I never thought of it as like something valuable as a gift until I had to share my time with my kids. No longer did I get 100% of their time. And so when I did have them, I was all in. There was no distractions. If you wanted to call me and talk to me as a friend, I have my kids. I'm not taking your call. It was like I was laser focused. This is my time. Then I had a big chunk of time where I didn't have my kids. So that's the time I spent with friends and God time. You know, go to the beach and read. Oh my goodness, hours sitting on the beach reading books to pour into me so I could become the better version of me. I think that balance is where's your time going? It doesn't mean you can't have hobbies and do things, but you have to just be aware that time is precious. How are you spending it? How are you investing it? How are you stewarding it? Finding that balance where there's time with God, there's time with friends, there's time with family, there's time doing your job and ministry and finding that balance. And I don't think I have it all figured out, Neil. I do know there was a book I read by Lisa Turkers called The Best Yes. And so I will say to myself, is this my best yes? Yes, this is a good yes. Yes, this is actually a really fun yes, but is this my best yes? And if it's not, it's okay to say no. And I think that women, moms, it's hard. We struggle. We always say yes to things. And then we find that we're overwhelmed with our schedules. So balance is finding your best yes and following the plan and the lane God has for you. Well, yeah. I mean, so many times I think people want to run in a lane that they're not, they shouldn't be in. There are some lanes I know I should not be in. And I think the sooner you can figure that out, the sooner I can figure that out, the sooner others can figure that out, I think is is the key that really is going to unlock everything for an individual. I truly believe that. And I think so many times when you're focused on what you're supposed to be in, synergy can happen. 
Where can folks go to get the book? Well, the book is called Depth. It's got a big tree on the front with these deep roots, so you can't miss it. And it's sold on Amazon. It's sold barnesandnoble.com, all the places. But if they want to go to my website, which is jodyrosser.com, J-O-D-I-R-O-S-S-E-R, there has a link where you can see all the places you can get it. And they can also, if they want a signed copy, I know sometimes people like to get that. The end of August is when my podcast started and my book birthday. I'm doing a thing where people want a signed copy. They can just email me at thedepthbook at gmail.com. They can buy it directly from me and I'll sign them a copy. I'm doing a kind of a special thing right now in honor of the birthday of the book. That's fun. Birthday of the book. Birthday of the book. It's crazy. One year old. Birthday of the show. All the birthdays coming together. That's nice. Do you feel like your show and your book are almost like people? You created them and they almost are like people. Do you feel that way or am I alone in that? How do you say that? Because I think a lot of times people refer to their books as babies. Yeah, my mentor would call it like that. Like you're going into the third trimester or you're nesting. So I do think there is things like that. I don't actually call it like a, I don't say like he or she. It's like you're birthing something new into the world. And since I have two kids, I know what that's like to birth a baby. I guess you can have it feel like that. I don't know. I, instead of saying the anniversary, I just like calling it its birthday. So like I lit a candle and blew it out. I mean, I don't know. I guess it is kind of cheesy, but it was fun. Yeah. So four years old, the birthday of the podcast and one year old, the birthday of the book at the end of August. August is a big month for me. Well, I say that because our show will be five in January. And when it turned wow. three, three, it was during the pandemic. So it must've been two, two or three. My daughter shoved cake in my face. I love it. Facebook Live, Instagram thing. But every year, yeah, I do go get it a cupcake and I usually will have like a little social media blowing out the candle thing for the show. Yes. Treat it like another person. Now, listen, I know it's not a real person. Everyone stop sending (laughs) emails. It's not a real person. I know that. I treat it as such because I think it does need care and it does need nurturing and it does need time and it does need energy and efforts put into it. Hardest chapter to write was what? Oh, hardest chapter to write. You know what? Well, (laughs) it's just funny. So there's three storylines. I think the ones on the divorce I were some of the harder ones because I wanted to be really careful that I just told my side of the story. I think when people are sharing their stories, I think sometimes they can overshare. And I wanted my book to point people to God. I wanted people to see that God was faithful in my life after my divorce. I didn't want to get there and say negative things about anything, my ex-husband, or just even to know that I could give this book to anyone that knows him or knows his family. And there was not one negative thing. And so I wanted to be so honoring. My kids are both reading it. My one son is almost done with it. I wanted them to be proud of this book for their mom. Like, this is the way God met me in my pain. This is the way God helped me. It's not a story where I'm trying to say anything negative about anyone else. And so I'm very honest and vulnerable about my issues. So just walking that fine line was sometimes difficult. There's many versions of this book did not enter the world. Thank the Lord. So, you know, in 2018, I I started writing and it was the craziest summer. I cannot even tell you how I would just wake up every morning between four and five with ideas in my head, like dancing around and I'd go sit down and just start typing. And my kids would wake up and they'd kind of get to play video games or whatever all morning. And then I, around 10 or 11, we'd st- I'd stop writing so I could go do something for them during that day because I was still a mom. Power hours that I wrote, I would go back and read what I wrote and I would say, I'm not capable of this. Like it just wasn't, it was like the Holy Spirit writing it through me. I just think that it was a really God moment time where I I just was in awe of him. Well, that version of the book has had many edits since, and I'm grateful because there was things I either overshared or thought, oh, I don't, this isn't important to share anymore. Or this chapter needs to be cut. You know, they call it kill your darling, get rid of something that even though you love it, it's not help others with the message of the book. And I had to really think of my reader more than just, I'm not here sharing my story. I'm here helping them through their grief, helping them through, I just think the whole process is hard. I don't know if there was one chapter, will be when I was being vulnerable and sharing my own issues. I, people always say, was that hard for you? And I was, I guess I wasn't hard in the sense that I knew it help others. You asked one time, what's your favorite quote. And one of my quotes in my house that I've written a little sign for is called my response is my responsibility. And that was something that was birthed out of my divorce is I used to just have respond however I felt. And if anger came out, then that's what came out. And if swearing came out, then that's what came out. And now I'm like, my response is my responsibility. And I, something my kids and I live by, and I, I teach it to them. Your response is your responsibility. And it's really frustrating when you're getting frustrated and they throw it back in your face because I've taught it to them so well. Now they'll be like, mom, your response is your responsibility. And it's like, oh, I know it's true. And I know you've grasped it. You know, it's good when they now know it. When they say it back to you, you're like, Ugh. that's a hard question. I don't know if there's one chapter. It is a hard question. And people tell me that. They're like, why? Why do you ask? that. And I said, well, because I think sometimes <laughs> when it's the hardest, that's when it's the best. Mm. I just think the whole process of writing the book was a very Holy Spirit activated led. And I just felt in awe of him. I actually made a sign called in awe of God. And I was going to write 2018 at the end because that was when, and then I was like, wait, I'm in awe of God for other years. So I didn't add the year at the end. And then it hangs in my bathroom. And it's just a reminder of you could do whatever God calls you to do when you 
partner with him and he will equip you and guide you. And definitely from someone listening out there, if that, if you feel God tugging on your heart, say that, yes, put on that shirt, whatever you got to do to announce it to the world or whatever, just tell family and friends. You got to tell someone though, if you try to do it without telling anyone, you're going to just then stop because there'll be roadblocks, there'll be obstacles. So you got to, you got to get an accountability person to help. I think that was the hardest part about starting my show was I told so many people and then iTunes took forever. And then I got an email one day saying that my artwork was too big. And so that's why it was being rejected. And then once I fixed it, it went through just fine. Yeah, I was very annoyed by that because it could have been out sooner. It came out when it was supposed to. And that's the way I was yes. looking at that. Well, awesome. So you mentioned the book. There is, you know, Jody, in your probably nervousness of being here. It's okay. I understand this completely. It happens on the show. People get nervous. You did forget one place that your book will be featured and available. So I don't know if you knew that or not. I didn't. Where is that? So it's going to be at OPSpodcast.com slash books that I love. It's going to be there as well for folks to take a look at I like love that. that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's okay. I mean, Thank I get you it. So You're much. nervous. It's fine. <laughs> It happens. I was like, what? <laughs> for a second, they were like, where else did I forget? <laughs> and set that was and spike. Yield. Do it all the time. <laughs> the other thing I was going to ask you is where can folks go to listen? Now, I would imagine just because I know this, they may not. Where can they go to listen to the podcast as well? It's on all the favorite podcast platforms. So if you have one, again, it's got a the cover art is a tree with deep roots and it says depth with Jody Rosser. They can just go to my website again. There's links. The hub is the website. Everything get, can get you to everything else. And I actually have a place where it has all the different podcasts of so Apple versus Spotify or whatever, all the different ones. Like there, So it has a link to all of them. So you don't have to try to find it because sometimes you type it in and you're trying trying to hunt it down. Direct links to all. I always say, listen on your favorite podcast platform and I have all the links. So jodyrosser.com would be the best place to start to find it. And then I would love to have them come on and listen. I, again, my hope in the podcast is to help others grow deeper in their faith and stronger in their relationships. And so sometimes I have authors of books on, sometimes I have inspiring stories. Uh, Right now I'm doing a series on the book where I have an acrostic in the book called Strength. It's how I weave the three storylines together because originally the book was just going to be on the divorce and it was like, okay, God, how do you write a book with three storylines? And so God gave me this acrostic for the word strength. And so each of those letters I'm doing a special episode on with people and it's been really fun. So there's sometimes little series. I want to encourage people along in their grief. I know how hard it is to walk through heartbreak and I want them to come out stronger on the other side because of their faith in God. That's great. That's what it's all about. Helping people. Yes. And it is pretty fun talking behind a microphone every week. I do enjoy it. I, I People say <laughs> I have the gift of gab and then people say that I also love to talk about books. So it's like a win-win. I get to do both. <laughs> get to do both. Jody. before we let you go, I do want to say thank Thank you again for being here today. Just really excited that we got to connect and just really just super, super excited about what what's going to be in store for you next. I can't wait to hear your next. I do want to say we do have to do some silliness. Now, we've had a little bit of silliness. We've had a little bit of humor, but I feel like now we need some big time silliness. So we do this thing at the end of the show <laughs> called Senseless. It's these six random questions. You don't have to answer all six. Don't worry. We have a die that makes it random and it is a North Carolina die. In a broken vessel, by the way, the cup is broken, as you can see oh, there. Oh yes, I love that. Fell off a shelf, and now it's now it's just a broken vessel used for silliness. So even broken vessels can be silly. Just saying. So here we are. Okay, love it. I love it. All right, you got a number five. Dun, 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 okay, dun, dun. it's even a light blue five. Yep, that's right. So question five is this: Mom and Dad need to hear this. My parents or a mom and dad? However you interpret that, they're kind of open ended on purpose. Hmm. I would just say for a mom and dad, they need to hear that their time with their kids goes so fast. And I have a child I just launched two years ago. He's 20 now. I have a 16 year old and I'm coming into the home stretch of parenting. And I would encourage a mom and dad that it may seem like, oh my gosh, this parenting gig is so exhausting, so tiring. I can barely handle it. But then they're little that there will be a point in your life where they don't live at your house anymore. You're going to miss that. So embrace every moment with them. You don't have to love every season. I would say every season has their ups and downs. Middle of the night wake ups, definitely a down, but baby stage, you know, there's some pluses. So like each stage has ups and downs, be physically present, but be emotionally present. That's where I struggled is I would sit on the ground and be there with my kids playing Legos, but I was everywhere else in my mind. I was, oh, I got this to do list. I got this. And so I would say be emotionally present as well as physically present. So be present. Yeah. I guess that wasn't as fun, huh? You want more fun answers. Sorry. (laughs) Sometimes they're fun. Sometimes they're serious. Sometimes I, I don't know. That's why I love this section that we do in the show is the idea that one, I never know how someone going to interpret the question. And I purposely write them so they are kind of a little bit cryptic, but a little bit like, what do you mean by that? Some of them are just really easy. One of them is coffee or tea and why. Some of them are really hard. There's such a spectrum there. Got it. Just silliness we do at the end. So Jody, again, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you. Well, guys and gals, 
kids and campers alike. That's it. That's all. That's our show today. How about that? That was pretty fun, wasn't it? I'm curious about this for you. The depths of you and how does that relate to your story? How deeply rooted are you into your whatever it is right now? Listen, no Bob Vila here. No green thumb. No garden expert here. Not that guy. Wrong guy if you're thinking that's me. Not him. What I am is this. I know my lane. I do. It's taken a year or so to get there. Maybe even longer. But I know what I'm supposed to be doing. And there is depth behind it. But what about for you? Where is your depth moment? Are you deep enough and deeply rooted enough in what you're doing? Or can really strong wind? come along and just rip you away because if you're not i want to ask yourself this question as you leave why am i not deep enough in that hmm. and how do i get deep enough in there well if you're wondering about the how i got a good friend jody here that'll probably help you with that and don't forget this as we get out of here do not ever forget remember when you walk in other people's shoes you really do get a different perspective on life thank you so much for listening really appreciate that never take that for granted and again remember this too stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.